Rob, welcome to the show. It's great to have you. Great to, great to be with, here with you and great to see you again. Likewise. Yeah, we've had the uh, pleasure of knowing each other and working together for quite a while. But today it's about uh, sharing the story of your journey and the journey of 29th Street and talking about the economics and the macro related to the multifamily space. Um, there's a lot going on right now. So want to dive right into it. Can you start by giving our listeners a brief intro on yourself and on 29th Street, please? Yeah, I'll start with myself. Really, my background started um, in investment banking. Realized I wasn't a, a fit there. Uh, moved over to Trizic Properties, which was the second largest office street. Um, really was part of that acquisition team. Uh, we were bought out by Blackstone in 2005. And thought strongly, number one, I, I did not like office. But number two was that I wanted to go downstream. Um during the sale of Trizic, I met a guy named Rick Hurd, um, who was at GE Real Estate. Me and him started a company called Strategic Capital Partners. The goal was to team up with local operators, uh, the key of that being local, all across the country. Um, that was the void in that space in 2005. Um, the issue, obviously, we invested in 2006, 2007, terrible timing. But we raised uh, about $350 million Um you know, made it through the downturn, a top 1% performer, but pension funds were really looking for the bigger guys. So eventually Waterton, I would say, took control of that company. Uh, the rest of it spun back into uh, more of an industrial development company. Um, and I was in a place where I did not want to go to a large institution. I, I'm, I feel strongly that a fund is just a bad structure uh, for multiple reasons, and, and we can go into that. And, and your software has actually solved a lot of those problems. Um, and I didn't want to go to a public company. So I found myself in a, a unique space in 2010 um, through a guy I rode crew with at Wisconsin, met Stan Borasnik, and really the rest is history. Um, back then, um, his view was single families was, was the right answer. Um, and our first home was on 29th Street. Um, acquired, gosh, we're one of the largest single family owners, uh, which was eventually acquired by Tricon. Uh, they took our 60-person team, and really, we morphed into a value-add uh, multifamily um, company in 2012. And the key to my background was when we did all those local joint ventures, I brought in all the acquisition guys that fought for it through the downturn. So while they've been at 29th Street 9, 10 years, I've known them for 15 to 20 years. So knew their <clears throat> new... Um, and a couple lessons learned, um, you know, when I had a fund, being local was very critical. They fought much harder. There is that responsibility to the community that where a non-local guy will not have. And number two, I felt alignment was the right way. I thought my acquisition guys should invest in their own deals, which oddly enough is very rare in our industry. So putting those two together um, and not doing a fund brought the highest quality acquisition guys to our platform. So currently we have 16 acquisition guys, each local to their market. And that's just how we've grown, Brandon. We've done one-offs um, all across the country. We've done about 150 one-offs and um, you know, have been successful that way. Well, it's a, it's been an amazing journey to follow. I first got to know you and Stan in 2016, uh, I think I've shared this with you both, but uh, 29th Street was actually the first customer that I signed up when I joined Juniper Square. So we'll talk a little bit more about the bet that you made on me and the company uh, at the earliest days. But before we go there, um, you know, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, your roots as a single family residential shop. You know, here we are in it's January of 2023 and, um, you know, single family for sale residential, single family for rent, built specifically as single family rentals are one of the hottest institutional sectors right now. Can you kind of tell us a little bit about how you got into that space and then why you got out of the SFR space or the single family space in general and into multifamily when you did? Sure. And, and you know, we're a firm that is really bottoms up. So we listen to our local guys and then they kind of tell us where the opportunities are. So when we started in single family, it was really buying the no brand. And then, and what happened was the goal was really to work with the owner, have them buy back their home. Um, we were buying it from local regional banks that were getting squeezed during the great financial crisis. 
And that's how it all started. Um, a lot of, particularly in the Bay Area, a lot of these homeowners eventually just took out a new mortgage due to price depreciation and we were taken out. Um, some people left, you know, gave us back the keys and the business was started. Um, we grew all the way from California to Florida and then everywhere in between and realized very quickly that the turn costs and the micromanaging it, of it was, was pretty tough. We did the first, um, uh, CMBS loan through Wells Fargo to, um, basically consolidate a bunch of different homes. We were buying them all cash and realized you know, it was a tough business to scale. Um, a lot of work, turn costs were massive. Everyone had two dogs, two kids, um, and it was pretty beaten up. So, you know, we, we kind of struggled with everyone's assumptions. So realized that, hey, listen, let's take this. And um, TriCon was a great partner to going public. Um, fast forward, we are building single family homes right now, a build for rent product. Um, do you think there's a huge play there to our surprise? The demographic is, is spectacular. Um, biggest reason is safety, right? Um, I thought it would be more families than it is. Um, to my surprise, the demographic has, has been absolutely fantastic. Um, and so we're building that in Phoenix, um, two of those. Um, so we're, we're kind of rolling that across the country, but I think it's great. I mean, retention is extremely high. Um, the ability to buy a home is, is really off the table and, you know, you can, you're kind of, your neighbor's close, but not too close. So, you know, that safety characteristic is, is real. Can you say a little bit more, expand on safety? How are you defining that? Yeah, during COVID, I mean, number one, everyone didn't want to, you know, everyone had, um, had germs and, and COVID and, you know, people wanted away from that and wanted their own space. So, uh, but there was also that safety characteristic where someone could break in. Um, so they liked multifamily, but it was just too dense. So a single family home, they viewed as, hey, listen, you know, someone could break in, but can't hear me if things went bad. We did a survey to our surprise. The biggest reason of moving into the BFR space was safety, uh, particularly for single females. So, you know, that's a de- desired demographic. So um, it was... Uh, you know, they wanted space, they wanted the amenities, they wanted a home, but couldn't afford a home. They also didn't want to do all the work that went with the home. So it was kind of, this was the solve for all of those checklist items. Got it. So, um, so you, you, you started in the, you started buying notes in the SFR space. You, you know, got out of that business through a, through a sale to Tricon. You started in the multifamily space, which we'll come back to. And now, you know, coming full circle, uh, it sounds like you're dabbling in uh, build to rent, or is this a core part of 29th Street strategy going forward? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. Really, 2018, we we readdressed our portfolio. We were value add buyers for a long time. Um, you know, accumulated 16, 17,000 units um, and realized very quickly we were just we just couldn't compete. Uh, when cap rates started to get in the low threes, we just started, um, you know, going back to the fundamentals. Hey, where is replacement cost? Um, you know, everyone will underwrite 300 in, in CapEx reverse, reserves. I mean, everyone that's been in the business long enough knows that's not realistic. So, you know, we just realized pretty quickly, hey, let's slide into development. Um, let's sell all this older product above replacement cost and rotate. And, um, uh, what we did is we sold a lot of our portfolio. We probably sold over 30 assets, all older assets, older vintage, 1031 into newer core plus. There was really no one in that core plus space. Um, no one, well, I shouldn't say no one, but all the traffic was in value add space. Everyone had a value add fund. And a particular advantage we had was we didn't have a fund. Um, you know, to raise a lot of money right now, the smaller the box, the more money you'll raise because, you know, it's a, it's a definition of what people will invest in so when we went out there we said hey listen let's take some chips off the table here's your i mean 40 50 irr which is pretty rare for multifamily. and went into core plus let's <clears throat> let's um you know go into preservation of capital and you know did a lot of long-term debt with those core plus deals but, but surely have our issues on some floating rate too um, and then it was just another business plan. So development in general is definitely a, a big business moving forward in our company. 
So we've talked, we've kind of bounced around a little bit about 29th Street just to kind of ground us. Can you just describe the company today uh, in a way that you would describe it to your investors or to your, you know, your colleagues? And then let's talk about some of the headline metrics in terms of, you know, units, capital, whatever you're willing to disclose. So we have some perspective of your size and scale and the types of markets that you're in. Yeah, sure. Um, I would say 29th Street's probably one of the most entrepreneurial firms out there. I wouldn't say we have a box at all. We really have the right investors to run a strategy pass. So kind of went into single family, got out, went into value add multifamily. I would say limited our exposure there, went into core plus, really became fully integrated by acquiring two property management companies and and rolling it into a Haven residential. So fully integrated. And then we kind of rolled that out. We have a prep equity platform that was filled the void for um, particularly now where people need gap equity. Um, obviously, have a development platform. And then um, we have a prep tech platform. So we view that as a win-win. We can take an interest in technology and hopefully give that technology to our tenants for the property for free. So our, our view is really try to kind of encompass every business that touches our residents. I talk to a lot of GPs, uh, especially institutional GPs, and my hypothesis is you might be not only one of the most entrepreneurial, but one of the largest multifamily shops that kind of traditional, if you will, institutional players may not know about. What are what is your kind of current AUM and you know rough range of number of units across the portfolio today? Yeah, sure. We're just. Uh... You know, we sold quite a bit. So I would say we're probably 18,000 units. Uh, we raised, oh gosh, um, about 500 to 600 million of equity a year. So do about 1.5 billion of, of acquisitions um, a year, all through family office slash high net worth individuals. Um, so obviously reporting, transparency, all very important in that space. Um, Try to be the most transparent group out there, but but don't spend a lot on marketing. Um, really focus on the opportunity. So having being local in 16 markets is it's just very attractive to families. Um, but we have probably a four billion under management um, and have a, a bunch of different business units. So try to tailor, but also listen to investors. I mean, to our surprise, investors have brought up markets or business units that that we've actually jumped on. Uh, we have an investor that said, "Why don't you look at Columbus, Ohio?" Didn't really know that market. Surely knew it was a big university, but went pretty big in there. We have, you know, we have uh, multiple properties. I think we have twelve properties there now. Um, but it's become an enormous part of our business, and you know, sometimes it's just listening to people. As a Michigan fan, I've never heard of Columbus, but I'll leave that for another sure. conversation. Um, okay, so about four billion of AUM, sixteen markets, roughly eighteen thousand units, and about one point five billion of acquisition volume per year. That's significant, and your team size is pretty lean. How do you think about driving this type of efficiency so that you can be a you know multifamily investment manager, property manager, developer? You're in three very operationally intensive businesses. Yeah, you know, I, I would say it was, uh, number one, acquiring fantastic talent. Um, these guys around me are all winners, and there's no doubt about it. So what we did is really start with a business unit lead. And they brought in, you know, I'll call their lieutenants. Um, but that's really how it started. So in, in I because I did so many joint ventures, I already knew who the good acquisition guys were. Through that process, we brought in a great development lead. He kind of brought in his group of people. Um, and then PropTech, I, I knew the guy to run it through Trizic. So he came in, brought in his team. So it was really starting with the top guy, um, you know, having connections there and just asking around of who is, you know, number one, who's honest. But we always start with the, I would say, the, the market manager and then grow a platform around them. Never with the, the never with the market, um, but always start with who's going to run it and then put a business plan around them. Uh, but yeah, you're right. We stay lean and mean. Uh, a lot of technology is helpful. A lot of asset management. Um, you know, you get a lot of help in Chicago from our corporate group. Um, but you know, having 16 acquisition guys, they're great at sourcing, executing, but they need some back office assistance on you know uh, accounting, paperwork, uh, investor communication. So high focus on that. And and how many professionals are in the corporate group approximately? 
65 in corporate, um, you know, 500 plus in property management. So before we move kind of on to the next topic, you know, you said something interesting and that I wasn't aware of and perhaps maybe controversial. Um, your acquisitions professionals are required, if I understood you correctly, to invest in the deals that they source. And you mentioned that that was not an industry norm. Talk to me a little bit about how you came to kind of this framework and, you know, what works about it or, you know, what might not work about it from your perspective. Yeah, number one, I wanted acquisition guys that were owners and sponsors and thought about it as an owner. I mean, all my years of being an acquisition guy, I never put a dollar in a deal. Um, and, you know, let's face it, I, I think every acquisition guy would admit this, that we threw a lot of stuff at the wall and see what would stick. Um, I only had upside, right? And that's just how that world worked for a long time. If I'm a part of a fund, I'm not putting in any money into those deals. You raise GP funds and so on. So all my acquisition guys are pretty senior. Um, they're not, you know, they're, I would say, 20 years in their local market. So they want to be owners. They want to invest in their own deals. So just change the structure. Then I can look you in the face if you're an investor and go, listen, me, of course, Stan, who's my business partner, is invested. But we also have our local um, acquisition manager, hopefully his analyst, and about 10 to 15 people in our, our organization will all invest in that deal. And I would tell you that that is beyond rare. That's interesting. I, I don't think I appreciated that, but it makes perfect sense. It's similar to alignment that a lot of technologies create where, you know, every employee gets the ability to, you know, have options or equity uh, in the business, um, which is which is a pretty common phenomenon, but not without its flaws for sure uh, in the in the venture uh, back technology company world. Um, so so the other thing that I want to dive into is it sounds like you are adamant that the non fund model is the best model for you and perhaps for others. One conversation I have very frequently is with groups that fit a very similar profile to 29th Street who tell me that as their next step, they want to become more institutional and to do that, they want to raise a fund. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about why you've made the decision to not be a fund manager at 29th Street and why you think that that is a kind of more advantageous position for you all vis-a-vis uh, -vis fund management? Sure. Um, you know, I lived it, number one. And I can tell you, being a first-time fund, having one marginal deal will wipe out the promote. And how do you keep your staff motivated? Became a big problem. Um, you know, of course, I want every deal and I'll be upset. But, you know, there's a reality component. If I have someone that's vested and, and all of their deals have gone well, but they didn't, they didn't have a seat at the table and a deal didn't go great, they could be wiped out of a promote. So all very, very senior acquisition guys, they don't want to go to a fund. I would tell you the talent level that goes in the, the one-offs is much higher, no doubt about it. Um, if they buy, fix, sell, they potentially could get paid in two years. Um, first, a fund could be 10 years. So how do you keep class A talent? They'd rather go do their own thing. But they don't, number one, know how to raise capital. Number two, they don't want to deal with back office. They're deal guys, right? And they do need some structure. Uh, they don't like it, but they do need a little structure. So, you know, I felt strongly that the one-off model was the future. Um, now, I, I didn't think the whole family office RIAs would be as big as they would be. And that, that you know, that market has exploded. I mean, there are no family office conferences 12 years ago. Um, but, you know, a lot like Juniper Square, that has solved a lot of problems, right? How do I do all the paperwork? How do I keep everything organized? That was a big question mark. Um, but we figured out a bunch of different solves and, um, you know, feel strongly that will be a way of the future. You know, I, a fund gives me full control, um, you know, full discretion. So if I go buy an asset and, you know, I'll name a market that's almost desired right now, L.A., right? Most people do not want to go in there. Versus a Florida or Texas where everyone wants to go. They, they want to control where they invest. And we give them full control. If they want to get out of California and do a deal in Texas, here, I have an asset in Texas. This is the strategy. They may like that. but Or they could just say no. You know, times are um, a little bit tougher and they're not ready to invest. But I want investors to have full control, full transparency. We're always available to answer any questions about that specific asset. 
But anything where I just say, oh, the fund is performing, they want to know the details. And, um, you know, we provide that for them. But, but I, you know, for the, for, for the day I die, I feel strongly that a fund is just an inefficient model. So the counter argument to that, and I don't have a horse in the race, but the counter argument to that might be that when you find a deal, you may, you'd have to go and raise the money for that deal and you could miss the opportunity um, because you, you know, you don't have the discretionary capital sitting there. Uh, that would probably be, and number two, when you do that and you do that, the number of times that you all have done it, the burden on your back office from a reporting perspective becomes so cumbersome that you can't operate. Now, I think we've solved number two, uh, but we could talk about it. But on the first one, how do you think that about that trade-off and what's your confidence in your ability to capitalize these great deals with the investor base that you have? Yeah, kind of two-part. I, I, I feel strongly that if I was part of a fund, my only way I get paid is AUM. So I have a huge incentive to get those dollars out. Now, if you're a, if you're a marginal deal and I get paid putting equity to work, so I think I might do that deal if it's a marginal deal. Um, first now, if I have to look an investor in the face and say, hey, listen, this deal's marginal, it makes you think twice. I don't have to do a deal. No one's telling me I have, you know, I can say no. Um, I have no pressure whatsoever. Um, and I, it's just a huge advantage. But kind of the second part of your question, having the network we have and having Stan, who's, who's been an excellent partner, you know, he had those connections. He, he was part of Citigroup's high network division. Uh, and then he was at Goldman also. So he brought a Rolodex that, that I surely didn't have. Um, so, you know, having 800 investors or 800 families um, to invest is pretty powerful. So I, I would tell you, we never have an equity problem. Uh, no doubt. It's always a product issue. Do we have a great story? If you have a good story, it, it's sellable. So 800 families or investors that invest with you on average, how many deals have each of those investors invested in? Is it one or two or, you know, every deal? How do you think about that? You know, everyone has their own theme. Um, people in California seem to want their money outside California. There's surely some good opportunities there also. So it all depends on, you know, what you might own. But I would tell you of those 800, we have probably a, a solid stable of 50 that kind of go with us on every deal. Um, the one great thing we've done is, is really limit the investment. Um, you know, me and Stan started this from really scratch. So we didn't have a big pocketbook. So if someone said, Hey, Rob, here's $5 million and they didn't, uh, and they didn't close, we didn't have $5 million back then. So we kind of capped everyone to that million dollars. Number one, it gave you, if you had 5 million, it gave you five deals. Um, so more diversity. But we, you know, we, what we did is artificially just say, Hey, let's put more individuals in each asset, give people more of a diversity. And then that's how it grew. But the only way to do that was to grow our investor base also. And then second side of thinking like that was if things, you know, tighten up and 400 families or 50% of families go away, we still have 400 families that may jump on some great opportunities. So we've always been trying to meet some big families out there that kind of say, Hey, listen, we know that it might be right right now, but we have a few issues, but that's where the opportunity arises. So on average, how many investors would you say are in each deal? Just rough, rough ballpark. 15 to 25 families. 15 to 25. And you're doing a billion and a half of deals a year. So that's roughly what in maybe, maybe not this year, but last year, that's roughly what 10, you know, deal a month ish. Is that the right cadence? That's that's right. Each each acquisition manager does about a deal a year, so about sixteen acquisitions a year. Fascinating. And how many people at Twenty Ninth Street are focused on investor reporting, investor relations, investor communication? Well, we've got probably about five focused on reporting, investor relations. Um, the software has solved a lot of that problem, but. Um, five to seven, always working on investor relations. So that's pretty, that's pretty impressive. And that's pretty lean when you compare it to more traditional ratios. Uh, before we kind of dive into the multifamily fundamentals, which is where I want to go next, let's talk about 
your use of Juniper Square. As I mentioned, you know, I I got to know Stan in a similar way through a uh, athletic connection, which isn't surprising to anybody who knows him. For me, it was cycling. For you, it sounds like the common connection was a rowing uh, teammate. Uh, and when I met him, I very vividly remember, you know, we we were talking about some of the opportunities that exist when you're managing large quantities of relatively um, small check sizes. And when I say relatively, I'm talking about, you know, the million dollar cap that you mentioned on any given investment. And I told him a little bit about Juniper Square, but admittedly, I was brand new to the company. I wasn't entirely clear on what we were doing myself. And his answer was something along the lines of, you know, Brandon, if you're there uh, and you believe in it, let's give it a try. Now, it wasn't that easy. We had to come in. We had to convince you, who I didn't know yet. We had to convince your entire team who would be using it. But suffice to say, that attitude, that mentality of being willing to take a risk, because at the time it was a risk. We were a seven person company with 40 clients, right? And you were one of them. Um, let's talk a little bit about that kind of entrepreneurial spirit as it relates to your prop tech investing uh, in general. And then let's talk about Juniper Square and what were the problems that you were trying to solve with Juniper Square and how have we kind of you know been a part of your journey so far? Yeah, no, you've been um, a huge part of our <clears throat> our success, no doubt. Um, number one, you keep all the paperwork organized. The game changer in your world was connecting to DocuSign, where they could actually do the do complete the paperwork um, online, fill it out, and wire in the the funds. Um, that was the game changer. Uh, now, in all transparency, we did run two softwares at the same time, making sure that you guys were here to stay. Um, I won't mention the other software, but you know, you became, uh, you guys grew, you guys listened, uh, and we kind of tailored the software around Juniper Square. So that worked out terrific. Um, number two was, you know, what we ran into where the larger the family, they always wanted to trust us first. So they would throw in small amounts of investment, we'd earn their trust, and then that would increase dramatically. So we never wanted to say no to a smaller investor, knowing that, number one, word of mouth, recommendations, but they could be a large family or, or one day could be a large family. So Juniper um, gave us that ability to say yes to a lot of investors that started small, but became very, very large over the years. That's great to hear. How do you think um, How do you think Juniper has helped to kind of inform your broader approach to technology or what is your broader approach to technology? You mentioned that, you know, your prop tech platform exists to invest in technologies that will help your renters, your tenants, your asset managers at the asset level where there's obviously tremendous efficiency to be gained. What does that kind of thesis look like and why are you active in this space as a capital provider or venture capital source for early stage startups? Yeah, we view it as a win-win. Um, number one, we can offer our units and say, hey, listen, number, we always try it. Um, I mean, I, I'll never believe what, what they tell me um, as stats. So what we do is, number one, test it, make sure it works, and then do our own data. Um, if we find it successful, then we kind of roll it out to our 20,000 units um, and do it as a win-win. Um, you know, we just took a position in Tour 24, thought it was a great way to, number one, lease at lunch, nights, weekends, when our leasing staff wasn't around. To our surprise, I mean, this is where we're doing our own homework helps. Um, millennials actually preferred Tour 24, even when our leasing staff was there. They just liked doing things on their phone. Um, so that was a lesson learned. And it'd be, I would tell you the success rate was much higher than what we thought. So the impact was phenomenal. So we viewed it as a win-win. It was a low-cost way to get leases, helps our properties, helps our investors. But also we took a position in the technology to say, let's tweak it a little bit here and there. So they, we took a board seat there. So tried to listen, um, but also tried to tailor a lot of this technology um, around what we're seeing in real life because there's tech guys obviously they're fantastic but if they don't listen to the reality of what's really going on or, or change uh it just won't be successful makes sense so let's let's transition to you know, the multifamily market fundamentals today we're obviously operating in a you know unprecedented you know uncertain time 
Um, I think, you know, the odds of a recession, according to a recent Goldman Sachs study, are somewhere between 45 and 55 percent. You know, some will tell you it's not if, but when. Others will tell you we'll, we'll avoid it, uh, but a close miss. So from your perspective as a, you know, vertically integrated, you know, owner, investor, manager of multifamily, let's go bottoms up. What are you seeing at the asset level? right inside of your properties relative to tenant retention you know rent increases uh delinquencies etc and then let's move up to kind of talk about portfolio wide and then ultimately what you see at the 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 macro level and i can you know we can step up together sure <clears throat> that's a lot to unpack but um i'll start with retentions you know extremely high right our back door is finally closed i can't buy a home for obvious reasons that we all know of, um, but rent growth is definitely decelerating. Um, you know, now there is some in-place lift to market still, um, but the fundamentals are beyond strong. Household formation down. Uh, we have seen um, leasing just slow, so or we're paying a little bit more on the marketing side to get those leases. Um, there's no doubt about that. But as we kind of look forward, it's still it's still doing very well, producing cash flow. Um, and what we're, we're really trying to do is get our arms around costs, right? Um, that seems to be a tough one. As we all know, the insurance market is in flux. Um, payroll been tough to control. Rent growth now on our side has been, you know, significant and it hasn't been an issue, but we're really going to NOI preservation mode and having Haven Residential, which is our property management company, everything over $500 needs to be approved right now. So if it's, a fix or replace issue, we're going to do our best to replace, um, or sorry, fix, and um, really try to control the, the cost to get to that NOI, but still provide great service. So that's why we became fully integrated. Uh, number two is, can we use technology to potentially save on costs? Like maybe the example I was using, Core 24, can I cut some hours out of some staff and use technology to solve that issue? Much cheaper option. And we've noticed that it's, it's probably more productive. So, um, you know, trying to tweak things here and there, no doubt, uh, but doing umbrella insurance policies, trying to get creative with a portfolio, um, and then, you know, beefing up our asset management team right now is, is really what we're focused on. I mean, I would tell you, yeah, we're still selectively looking at acquisitions, but it's slowed tremendously. Like, let's just focus on what we have, be honest to and transparent with investors, and then kind of, you know, come out of this and, and have a strong team. On on the asset side, you know, it, I think it's it's not a secret that multifamily was one of or is one of the best performing asset classes over the last three ish years. That said, you know, you're the you know you're the leader uh, of the business uh, and and focus on you know not only acquisitions but you know day to day operations at a strategic level. You know, when you think about your asset level performance, what are one or two things that kind of keep you up at night that you're most concerned about uh, in this current environment? I would say rent growth control number one. Um, we're, we have some properties located in areas that are very tenant friendly. Um, no issues there, but you know we've been restricted on rent control for a long time. Now, um, now we can't evict. So that will top line, that will hurt top line. And, and we are concerned about that. Um, number two is occupancy. Right, it is an occupancy game. Um, now, I'd rather have heads and beds than completely empty. There was a little bit different story 12, 24 months ago where we could push rents and, and maybe those renovations helped. But now we're concerned about um, occupancy, retention. Let's not push rents. We've noticed that classic units, I mean, people are priced more sensitive right now. And we're, you know, classic units are leasing much quicker than renovated units. So we've decided, hey, let's do you know quick turns, um, high ROI on those turns, but let's just turn them quickly and, and keep it full. That's interesting. Do you think that classic units outperforming the renovated units is primarily due to cost or is there something else driving that? 100% cost, um, price sensitivity. Interesting. How um, I, I know you don't have a fund, so you probably don't look at things. Uh, you know, at the my fund is performing well level. We've already established that, or not performing well level. But when you look at your kind of original, um, you know, value add assets that you may still own against your core plus assets, 
And by the way, if you could define core plus and multifamily in case anybody's wondering where the delineation is, that would be great. Um, how is the performance of the, you know, uh, of those two asset types doing relative to one another? You know, the big difference is just credit. Um, you know, core plus will have higher credit. Now the flip side is I don't have that upside I could eventually get, you know, value add typically 70s, 80s, early 90s assets where I can renovate, typically get uh, an uplift in rent. Um, we do it. We used to do a lot of that. Well, Core Plus is really soft turns. I would say 2005, newer uh, nine foot ceilings, where if I do a renovation, I can't get as much of an uplift. Um, so two different products completely. I, I would say credit has been the big one on value add, which are typically older, more workforce housing. If it's between you and groceries, you're going to lose that. Um, and I and I totally understand. Um, first, if you're in core plus, the typical disposable income is a little bit higher. So we've seen credit just be higher there um, in that product. But surely returns are a little bit lower. Uh, but the uplift in value add, while we scaled back renovations, when we come out of this, you know, potential recession, hopefully we can start renovating again, and there's more uplift in that value add when we're ready. And are you seeing any residual impacts of some of the recent technology layoffs, or kind of the broader, you know, downward shifts in the degradation of the macro environment impacting the demographics of the renters in the core plus portfolio, or, or how is that? Is that having an impact at all? Still early. I've not seen it yet. Um, I have seen a few people lose their job and move home, but it's been pretty minimal. Now, we surely are cautious, um, but I have not seen the impact yet. Got it. Makes sense. Um, so, so last question on kind of the multifamily, but as you move up, you talked a little bit about, you know, floating rate. Uh, you know, floating and fixed rate debt, obviously with interest rates going up, you know, how do you, how, how does this impact, you know, how do operators, investment managers and multifamily think about rate caps and what has been your experience, you know, recently, you know, working with any banks in terms of, you know, needing to come to terms on uh, kind of any, any deals that, that might need to be renegotiated at this point, given the relative uncertainty in the market? Yeah, I would say, uh, you know, banks have, have really not been willing to work with us much. Um, some have insurance companies that are a little more flexible. Um, the agency is not so much because they've sold off much of the, much of the uh, tranche. So I'm typically dealing with BP's buyers and, you know, those, those are usually operators. So not much sympathy there. Um, overall, yeah, you're right. The, the caps or the next cap. So the, the cap reserves that are have, they have to escrow to buy the next cap have been tough. Um, and that's eliminated some cash flow at, at some of our assets. I mean, some have been pretty impactful. Now we will get that cash back if we refinance. Um, but the rapid rise of, of interest rates have made that cap just, I mean, one property went from $800 a month to a tad under $200,000. Um, now that's eliminated the cash. And the problem is they amortize it over their main term of that cash, a uh, cap. So it's it's kind of a double whammy. We're in the money on the cap, then they amortized it over 11 months, which became very expensive. Now we'll refinance, and we're going to go to refinance, but it's going to be a short-term cash crunch. We'll refinance, hopefully get that cash back, and we're off to the races. But but you know the 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 debt is still very liquid out there. Multifamily is very liquid. A lot of buyers, uh, the agencies are still there. Um, being an ex office guy, I do appreciate that. Um, so, you know, we have a lot of options. Um, so not, no, surely concerned, but we're finding ways around it. So as you look out for the balance of 2023, what advice would you give to the Fed uh, if they were listening to this podcast in terms of ensuring that we don't have a uh, cataclysmic uh, cor correction here uh, like we did during the global financial crisis? Yeah, I mean, I've probably read every economic report. And I would just say, you know, wait and see. Um, the impact that you've made. I mean, just to keep r raising rates at this speed is, is going to have some consequential impact. Um, you know, um, there's no way around it. It's just going up and we're all kind of making do, but um, sooner or later it has to give. Um, you know, we're all trying to be good patrons and, and not increase rents, you know, over the top. 
But there comes a point where our interest rates are going up, our expenses are going up, obviously, due to inflation. So there's only one thing we can do, right, is increase rents. Um, it will be interesting to see over the next 12 months where the NOI margins go, uh, but controlling expenses will be difficult. Looking into your crystal ball, how many more times do you think the Fed will raise rates for the balance of 2023? And for our listeners, we're recording this January 25th of 2023. I knew that. I, I, you know, number one, I wouldn't be here. Uh, but two, I'd probably be on the beach somewhere retired. <laughs> but, uh, you know, my, my gut tells me they will slow um, and, and look at the impacts they've made. Um, so I'm guessing 25 bips for, you know, probably two more times. Um, and um, let's see what happens. Uh, but you can see, right, all the layoffs are happening. Um, they're definitely having impact. I'm not sure how unemployment stops the inflation. I, I, you know, I don't know the cause and effect there. Um, but I do think that just the supply chain is catching up. And I think that will slowly settle a lot of the inflation. I don't think we need to lose a lot of jobs, but they seem to be stuck on that equation. So hopefully they kind of put, put, you know, separate those two and really focus on uh, the supply side. Awesome. And my last question that I like to ask all guests is what advice would you have for somebody who's looking to get into the sector that you're in? So the multifamily space today, uh, based on some of the lessons that you've learned over the course of your career in building 29th Street Capital. Um, you know, I've had the the honor of, of having a, a fantastic business partner. Um, you know, in, in a strange way, um, I don't think we'd be best friends. Um, and I surely don't think we could live in the same town. But when it comes to creating something special, I think we, you know, we, we definitely argue when we bitter, but, you know, we don't get mad at each other. It's all very productive. We challenge each other and we're very good at two different skills. I am not very good at fundraising. Um, I like being in the field. I like getting my hands dirty. I like knowing everything about the asset. Um, that's just what I'm good at. He's very good at investor relations, being very bluntly honest and transparent um two different skill sets completely um you know i like building things he likes working out um with investors so you know not my thing so i would say focus on getting a good business partner number one it's great to bounce ideas off particularly if you're different um we've done that a lot um and we kind of say hey listen uh, the bottoms up philosophy has been worked very well for 29th street hey what are you seeing in the field me and Stan bounce things off each other. What with positives, negatives, let's try it with our own money, make sure that it's, you know, it works. Um, and then kind of roll it out to investors um, and say, this is what we've done. This is who the market expert or business unit expert is that we're betting on and then roll out a business there. But, you know, you don't need to go fast. You need to make sure you have the right people in place. Um, I can't tell you how many people say, hey, listen, I, I want to grow in Austin, Texas and are in Chicago or California. Well, not having that local boots on the ground um, it is extremely impactful um, because there's some you know responsibility to the community that you can't put a dollar sign on it, but it's real. Number one, they know all the local brokers, they know what's going on, but I can't stress being local and, and alignment. Um, having an acquisition guys invest in their deals is, is a game changer. They think twice about that extra spend, they'll be there longer. I mean, just turnover. Um, alone can hurt a company. You know, we don't lose anyone. Uh, retention is extremely high um, because we all participate in each other's wins and it's created a culture that, you know, I think has produced a lot of winners. I love that. And I've observed the same thing uh, watching you from afar in terms of crawl, walk, run, be brutally transparent. And I love what you said about, you know, finding the right business partner. You don't need to be best friends, but you need to be complementary to each other and, you know, specifically attack the problem, not the person. I think that that's a great, uh, a great uh, set of philosophies to operate from. Rob, it's been terrific having you today. As always, it's great to chat. And until next time, thank you for joining me. Always good seeing you. Thanks, Brandon.